we laid out in the last session the idea that systems thinking is a powerful tool that you can use to address the you know real complex challenges um, that are associated with the SDGs. What we're going to do in the next three sessions is really look at specific examples of how that's done and places where it can be used um, and the tools that you can use to make systems thinking not something that's sort of a theoretical approach, but rather a practical tool that you can apply on an ongoing basis to real world problems. So let's go to the next slide. The traditional way that innovation is done in like an innovation lab or a workshop is that you sit around and you brainstorm ideas. So many of us have probably been involved in events where you're given a Sharpie and a bunch of post-it notes and you write ideas down on the post-it notes and you try to get as many post-it notes up on the wall as possible. Once you've got all those post-it notes, you then start to whittle them away until you come up with the one best post-it note. And that post-it note then becomes the winner, the idea that you're going for. That approach um, has some challenges to it. So next slide. It tends to generate a rush to solution. Because what you're doing is very quickly doing things off the top of your head, and you're trying to come up with something concrete, you tend to end up with rather obvious problems, something like programs don't communicate well with people in an urban context. And then you jump to a fairly obvious solution that we maybe need a mobile app to communicate with people in that context. And that sort of rush to quick solutions doesn't necessarily produce a bad answer in the sense that it's something that would be, you know, terribly inappropriate, but it's not necessarily a very powerful answer. And there are several ways in which this works against you. So next slide. One is that you tend to focus on problems that are that you can see and that are fairly obvious. And as a result, you end up with a small problem which no matter how big your solution is, is still just a small problem. So that there's no real opportunity for you to really make a big impact simply because you selected a small problem. Next slide. Sort of a classic example of this, of a really great innovation addressing a very small problem is the Segway. So the Segway has wonderful technology involved with it. But the actual problem it was trying to solve apparently wasn't very big because there weren't very many people who found an actual need for segways. So this danger of getting trapped by small problems is the first one, but there's other challenges too. So if we go to the next slide, <coughs> there's a danger that even if you manage to identify a big problem, the rush to solutions will end up being a small solution. So that even if your solution works, you've really only begun to chip away at the problem itself. And as a result, this is what a lot of sort of mobile technology projects end up being. It's a mobile app that's going to try to make a huge difference in a pandemic. But the reality is, it only has so much that it can do because of the size of the solution. And there's a third danger on the next slide, which is perhaps less obvious. Once you rush to a solution, you're trapped on that path. So as you're looking at, for example, dealing with a pandemic through a mobile app, you may have different versions of the mobile app or different designs of the mobile app but you're really trapped on that path of how do I make my mobile app a bit better rather than imagining an entirely different solution. This is where systems thinking can really help you out because what it allows you to do is it allows you to look at the problem with richness, to see the entire complexity of the problem, and then consider possible alternative solutions because you've got a big view of the, pro of the problem, you can also have multiple views of possible solutions. And this provides you both 
the power of dealing with a big issue as well as the flexibility of creating multiple solutions. So this is really a important shift that you can get by using systems thinking to examine the problem space rather than simply resorting to you know, post-it note ideation. Next slide. So what would we say can, constitutes a big idea? Impact, scale, minimizing cost and harm, these are all things that we can attribute to an entire system of a solution rather than an individual piece of technology or an individual change. Next slide. So I can talk about now how do we do this practically? How do we come up with an idea and not rush into a small innovation? And I'm sure plenty of us, I've certainly done it on this call, have said, you know, not exactly like this, but we need to solve poverty. Okay, let's, I don't know. Let's build a new type of shelter. Um, and and you just you rush to what you see and that sounds like a great idea and you can do it. But rushing to that uh, solution doesn't explain how difficult it will be to get to, to implement that solution and it doesn't actually explain the impact of that solution on the whole problem. So the way that we understand um, bigger problems and therefore create bigger and high impact solution is we draw a diagram of how the world works. And this is a diagram of clean cook stoves. Then you can see there's different actors, there's different activities, certainly connections, and you start to group things as well. And so there are many examples of uh, great cook stove technology, great clean cook stove technology. I was looking at one the other day. But there are few that can talk about the business operation of production and local agent and distribution logistics at the, at the same time as they can talk about how does the person who's going to own or buy the stove actually use it? How do they learn how to use it? at the same time as, and how does that relate to what kind of things they cook and traditional community practices of cooking and eating? And then how does that relate to um, negative side effects on the people who currently sell fuel, the kind that, you know, wood or other things, which might not be a bad thing, but there are negative side effects which need to be taken into account fuel purchase, family budget competition. There's all kinds of parts to something which seems fairly basic. And as the cook stove market becomes more competitive um, in places like East Africa, which it certainly is, that challenge only becomes greater. And so people who are now entering the cook stove market are finding it more difficult because they there are many types of clean cook stove with many different time, types of business models and, and, and contexts that they're working in. So you've got to draw a diagram. And luckily, I like to draw these diagrams. So um, one of the programs uh, that I'm currently running in South Sudan uh, with a number of different agencies, we, are, we have been drawing diagrams around how the world works to um, adapt innovations to these problems. And so some of this comes from that program. And so when I talk about um, how we practically draw one, it's very simple and I can take you through that now. What we generally start with is a primary beneficiary. And when I talk about primary beneficiaries, um, there are many beneficiaries in systems work. You'll have governments as beneficiaries. You'll have NGOs as beneficiaries. You'll have uh, maybe the person who used to sell the fuel to the um, to the lovely lady who now has a cook stove. You, the, the, everyone in that system who needs to be part of that system should be a beneficiary, should have some motivation and incentive to act. But who is the primary beneficiary? Who is the person that has to have impact and outcome or there's no point in doing this? And if you start with them, you can then start to add what's around that person, activities, resources, different actors. So this is an example of a woman 
who wants to provide clean water to her family. She has to walk to that borehole, but she'll that container needs to be clean, it needs to be maintained, and she needs to boil the water if she's going to use it for um, drinking. But she also has other water needs like farming and animals and washing. And as you start to expand this, these maps, um, you can start to see linkages like the ability for this woman to talk to her local government about improving the borehole or the other borehole challenges like boreholes running out of water or security issues where boreholes start to be inaccessible. Borehole maintenance and the ability to train and resource the borehole long term. You can also start to add um, many other challenges and incentives or motivations. So understanding that the local government, perhaps in this case, wants to look good and be voted into a higher office is fine because it is the real world and so how do we work with that? At the same time, how do we work with a farmer who may not necessarily care about clean water but really wants his cows to survive? And knowing, acknowledging and seeing those links between incentives can also be really powerful. So this is an example uh, of a map that we did in South Sudan. And to, um, to explain this, this was a challenge around a community nutrition volunteer. That's the woman in the centre with her um, piece of paper. And the challenge was we want um, better data from community nutrition volunteers. And so we, we ran to a solution. It was we need a database, we need a phone, we need an app. That person enters in um enters in the data into the app and it will create better outcomes, lower secure, uh, severe acute malnutrition and moderate acute malnutrition for children. And then we started to draw the map and we looked at different um, groupings like in the top corner, the training and identification of community nutrition volunteers and screening um, of children by those community nutrition volunteers. And the whole cycle of attitudes and community attitudes towards malnutrition and of course the treatment centres and uh, institutional interests with the Ministry of Health. And this uh, actually continues to grow and go down, but I've just put a section of it in here. And it didn't take very long. This was an hour or two to, to build this out. Um, and, and when we started to look more deeply into the challenge, what we saw was actually giving that community nutrition volunteer a phone and an app or a database actually wasn't going to solve the problem, we might get certain kinds of data, but that wouldn't be better data to help um, uh, child uh, nutrition in this case. And I'm not saying that databases don't help because certainly there are places that they do. But in South Sudan, where phone penetration is low, where many people won't have phone connection to internet at sometimes power, this wasn't the right um, approach. And so what we did was we looked across a range of different innovations and two were chosen. The first one was around um, actually greater accountability and coaching of the community nutrition volunteers, giving them a greater role, um, supporting their kind of role within the community, focused on that appreciation by community incentive. Um, and so now they have more support uh, in understanding what their job is and in some, some accountability mechanisms from the community. And the other more transformational um, uh, innovation that was chosen, and some people know this or some people won't, is a shift that's currently happening towards um, community, uh, sorry, not community, family managed or mother managed uh, malnutrition. And so the innovation was linking that parent caregiver and child closer to the health facility and making sure that the parent could actually um, adequately manage the malnutrition of their child, could find and understand when the child was malnourished and then could find their way to that health facility more easily. And that's actually quite a um, radical change because it 
then takes out essentially the role of the community nutrition volunteer and changes the screening process, changes the institutional process of support, um, but is starting to show that um, there is much better management of child malnutrition if it's done well. So it gives you an idea that if you rush to a problem, there is a simple solution, something will come up. And certainly it's exciting, a database, an app, a phone to get better data is really exciting. But if you explored this and you took the time to really map it and see where the connections were, um, you could see that you could do something with much higher impact that would be much better at solving the problem than um, providing a database. I'll pass you back to Dan. I mean, before we go back, maybe I could ping a couple of questions off you on that prior diagram. Please. Mm. So when you were building this diagram, hey, go back to the prior diagram. There we go. When you were building this, who was in the room? Who was helping you build this? Were these people who were like trained innovators, trained systems-y people? You know, talk a little bit about maybe what that process was. Yeah, great. So we had um, a very committed nutrition manager who was um, not the technical specialist for the organization, but a manager of one of the programs who was based out in the field in Sudan. Um, we had some local partners um, of uh, that nutrition program, so CBOs. Um, we had kind of coming in and out um, some of the program development quality people who could talk a little bit about um, the institutional side, but there was no senior management. There was no uh, lead technical expertise uh, for health. There were people who do programs, uh, who implement programs. Mm. And the post-its, I see you have three different colors there. It, what's mm. what's the what's the magic of the colors on, on the post-its? Colors are magical. You definitely don't need to use them, but I'm a bit of a colorful person. So the um, you see, we've got all the actors uh, as icons, so we can identify them easily. The yellow uh, post-its are either resources or activities. The orange post-its are challenges and the green post-its are incentives or motivations. Okay. Hey, Nella um, brought up a question uh, asking, how do you determine where to start implementing a change program? So with all the possibilities, how did you come up with a way to prioritize all the, the different things that you might do and, and decide which ones were best? So the really great, the thing I love about systems mapping and systems thinking is you can open up a world of what exists. So it could have been that um, the nutrition team decided that they would um, start something from the beginning. They would do kind of a new innovation. But when we looked at this, uh, we use the same kind of strategic filters that you would normally use uh, around um, uh, what's the mandate of the organisation, where, what program is this going to be used in, so what are the kind of um, strategic walls, what is, what's that strategy box, what are the kind of capabilities of people within that program. So we could have done something um, completely different but would the organisation and would that team have the ability to implement it or would they want to get um, capacity or capability building, which is also fine. Um, we looked at the what Dan was talking about previously, which is the size of the problem and the size of the solution and what fit within their country level strategic interests and what would be supported by management and the Ministry of Health and the cluster and that kind of thing. So starting to kind of layer on these um, motivations and incentives. What, what do the actors want and is this solution fit for purpose? And how big, how much impact can we get out of, um, of what we're doing? So some of the, there's many different um, strategic lenses or layers, but they're some of the ones we used. 
Cool. So Paula was asking, um, when do you start looking at grouping these things? So you've got a very elaborate diagram here. Um, how did this level of sort of sophisticated arrangement emerge out of out of your process? It's it's simpler than you think it is, <laughs> which is not to be opaque. Um, so really, these maps, uh, these these system maps, um, can be as big or as small as you want. And as Dan um, alluded to before, there's never an so the, the first version of this map was 20 minutes of three people sitting around a table and just drawing, what does this look like? What does this challenge look like? And then we went back and we spent maybe an hour, an hour and a half building it out further. And at the end of that period, we said, okay, so what kind of things do we have in here? What kind of groups do we have? And it kind of it came together quite easily, as you can see in this um, map. You kind of said, okay, so there's this whole background of the CNV. And what you can't see but what's under here is there's a whole piece around the CNV supporting their family. And so where do they live and how far do they need to travel and how do they look after their children? And screening is very different from treatment. And that's done in different locations. Um, and then, of course, the community and community attitudes is very different again. So the answer to your question is you can group at any point you wish um, and you can continue to grow this map and change this map. And maybe if you, you thought, actually, we want to focus on training and identification of, C of community nutrition volunteers, then you could build that piece out much more and maybe you'd even have um, training would be its own box and then identification would be its own box. So this is certainly not a final uh, piece of the system. This is where we got to which was good enough to um, decide what we wanted to do. Let's go on to the next slides, but I'll quickly answer Paula's um, other question of can this lead to different um, solutions? And the abs answer is absolutely yes. And What's nice is that it can lead to different solutions halfway through the program too. So if you've decided that the original idea isn't working quite the way you have, you wanted, you've got a place to go back to, to reimagine and to restart. And this is, ties into the idea that these maps, these diagrams of how the world works, they're continually evolving. And so you can think of them, everyone is a draft that you're continually changing and updating and expanding as you go forward. And the same type of tool for, for what it's worth can be used to draw out how you want the future to look. So you don't have to just have a map of the way the world works. You can also do a map of the way the future should look. Next slide. So one of the ways you can try to test out these maps is you can try to talk about strategies. These are great collaborative tools. One of the things that often happens with experts is they have all of this detail in their mind, all these different pieces of things, and they have a really hard time sharing it with anybody. And as a result, it's very difficult to collaborate in a meaningful way across a group of people with perhaps different backgrounds or different levels of expertise. One of the ways to test out whether your model or your map is working well is to actually use it to talk about the problem. Talk about how things work, talk about where you see opportunities, and then using that as a base for your discussions. So instead of having just a bunch of random post-it notes up on the wall, you've now got a picture of how the world works, which you can use to really foster alternatives, critiquing solutions, identifying new possibilities. And so this becomes a key picture, a key test of the map is whether or not you can use it to tell strategic stories to each other. 